Hello, I am Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, and we are coming at you again with another uh, business update where we're offering perspectives from local businesses uh, and nonprofits to be able to kind of showcase themselves and bring attention to uh, the unique challenges that they're facing uh, in light of the business interruption with the closure uh, due to the coronavirus. Um, I'm happy to be joined with Demetra Murphy this morning, who is the owner of Daddy Jones Restaurant in Magoon Square. How are you doing this morning, Demetra? Not too bad. Sun is out, you know, trying to... <laughs> trying to stay positive, I hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's... it's well, good. We start off um, each of these interviews the same way, just asking uh, people how they're doing and how their employees are faring um, just in the middle of this really unique kind of situation that we're all in. Um, so, uh, Demetra, how are you and your employees doing? Uh, we're doing OK. There's a good amount that are on unemployment. I have two working part time um, they're doing the takeout, you know, Thursday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday with me. Um, and the rest we check in. Does anybody need anything? Do you need me to order a produce box for you or your family? And they kind of all seem to be so far um, healthy and a little bored. And they're all dying to come back to work. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get them to be able to sort of think of the bigger picture. Um and that actually staying home is safer. Uh, the two that are coming in are really not with a ton of other people and don't have to take public transportation. So it's, it's tough, but they felt better coming to work than just staying at home. So. We, were, we were talking a little bit before we started um, about early on in this crisis, uh, probably about mid-March, um, when people were starting to uh, get notices that businesses were going to be forced to close and how you you had actually made the decision um, before then to to take action. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what action you took at the beginning of this? Yeah, so I, that that Friday, it had been in my in my head from the night before. And when I came into work, I was on the phone with my brother driving over. Um, and I live in East Somerville, so this is a short drive, right, from East Somerville straight down Pearl Street to Magoon Square on Medford Street. Um, and I was telling him that I didn't think that we should open. And, uh, and he lives in uh, San Francisco, so it's a very different, you know, they kind of had to hunker down, I think, earlier than we did, definitely. Um, but like, you know, officially. Um, and I said, I go, I don't know. I, I just feel like it's not right to be open. And we have so many different people that come in and out of the place. And, you know, I have two small children. My, I live in a house next door to my parents. So I have elderly parents at home and just the thought of all the in and out and back and forth and what kind of risk I would also be bringing home and, you know, coming into the restaurant with the staff, it just seemed irresponsible. And I am very, uh, uh, I just don't like to ask people to do something that I don't want to do. And so I came in and at three o'clock started talking to my two managers and then the rest of the staff came in at four. And I was like, I just don't, I don't think it's right for us to be open. And they all said to me, well, we don't mind if you go home and we'll stay here. You know, we're going into St. Patrick's Day weekend and it's going to be busy. And I was like, I appreciate that, but that's not right. And I was kind of having like an anxiety attack a little bit, not a, an official one, but I was really stressed. And of course I'm having these sort of like hot flashes and I was like, do I have a fever? Am I sick? Am I just stressed? So I honest to goodness, see, I, they go, think about it and get back to us. So now it's four o'clock. I drive home, <laughs> check my temperature <laughs> to make sure that I'm not losing my mind. And I didn't have a fever. And I went back to, and I drove back to work. So I went drive, drove down the street to kind of clear my head and come back. And now it's four thirty ish, like four twenty. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's fair. And, and then you say, well, we support you in either way. So, you know, everybody made themselves food. And at that point, this was because we didn't have any guidance yet. We said, okay, we'll, we'll touch base again on Wednesday. And in the meantime, 
I posted that we weren't going to be open and immediately started getting people saying, well, how can I support you through this? I love what you're doing for your staff. And I was like, well, I don't want you to send me money. Like, I don't know. Let's do something with this positivity. So I was like, well, a lot of people aren't going to have food. Why don't we create a GoFundMe so that people can donate it, donate money, and then we can give food to the people that need it. And, um, and that's turned into a much kind of a, b- a bigger thing now. And we're getting so many inquiries that we had to kind of transform the way it was happening. Um, so it makes me very happy to feel needed because I think as restaurants, part of what we want is to make people feel good and also to feel loved. Like we like to be behind the scenes. I, I like to be behind the scenes, but I also want people to feel good. So it's been this kind of interesting morph of, being able to feel like I'm doing something for somebody. But in this case now it's people that I don't know because we take the food and we just drop it off on their doorsteps. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and now we brought back takeout a little bit. So it's been kind of balancing the two. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you, can you expand on, on uh, how it is that people are buying food for other people? Um, and sure. how- so it started as, as just them making donations to the GoFundMe and I used to coach uh, cross country up at Somerville High School. So I reached out to one of the other coaches and to the uh, athletic director. And I was like, listen, we're doing this. If you have any connections to families in need or somebody that you know that will need something, because having been up at the high school, I, I know what, I mean, one of the things that used to really touch me about being a coach was that the kids wouldn't want to leave practice. Mm-hmm. And it would make me think that they don't want to go home because it's whatever's going on at home isn't as good as what they have with the team, with the unity. And I've gone on to hire a lot of former athletes or been introduced to people through the athletic department to hire, you know, local Somerville kids that have grown up within the restaurant. So I immediately went to them and was like, what do you need or what do you, or who do you know? And you started getting copied on emails with um, guidance counselors and, um, from there, now there's some different organizations that have reached out to me about doing drop-offs. And um, so basically, it's been different, like hot food or cold food or ingredients, um, hot food or dry food, um, or produce boxes. And so basically, we get an address, and we send them a text message, coordinate what we can do, and then we um, drop off on their porch. And we've also bought food from penny packers. So we didn't want to just help ourselves. We wanted to help Magoon Square. So we bought food from penny packers and we've been able to do some penny packers uh, drop-offs to families. And we've given out some gift certificates to La Posada because La Posada is a few doors over from us. And they have been able to, you know, people can get takeout from them or a delivery from them. And then we also bought some produce boxes from uh, Dark Horse. So... Uh, Dark Horse Public House is doing the produce for sale yeah. and they reached out to us and had six families that needed food. So we were able to buy produce from them and turn it into food that went out to some families. That's that's really great to hear the way that um, you've come together to support the larger community and people uh, who need food um, in this time of rising food insecurity, um, as well as uh finding a way for all these businesses in the area to come together and, and help facilitate that. That's, that's really, uh, it's a lot, it sounds a lot like a non like nonprofit work. <laughs> um, so, and, and that you've been able to adapt your, your, your business to be able to do that, uh, at this time is, is really, uh, commendable. Um, and, oh, go ahead. No, I just, I wanted to say it was, we've been so loved by the community and we're just like a simple restaurant, right? We're not doing anything that's, you know, James Beard worthy. It's always been to us about the people nearby and the community and everybody feeling good. So it it kind of felt like this was, how can we think about all of these things going on? You know, and then weeks later, I'm seeing these uh, posts of like farmers that can't get their food and they're just throwing it away. And I'm like, what is wrong with all of us where there's people that need food and people that have food to give it away and we can't all connect. And why haven't restaurants years ago been asked to feed people that need it? Like 
there's so much, you know, things like food waste and, oh, I'm trying to special this before it goes bad, or I could cook it off and, and, and make it for a family that, that needs it as opposed to wasting it. And I, so, you know, the fact that these are even issues is really frustrating. Like mm-hmm. I, <laughs> so I'm glad that we can do something that can help others. What makes me really sad. So I live in East Somerville, right. And I've been doing a lot of these drop-offs and I'm like, yep, I know that street. Yep. I drive by that house all the time. So it, it hurts to think that you're in the middle of something and there's so much pain going on all around you. Um, which is, you know, like I was like, I live in my house, I have a yard, my kids can run around and I feel guilty. It sucks. Like it makes you think a lot about just Somerville as a whole. And I feel like we're really lucky that there's so much of a network. And I think that the city does a lot. And I think that there's a lot of organizations looking to help, but it makes you really sad or it makes me really sad that there's so many people that need help. Mm. So I have a hard time because I have this restaurant that's, you know, struggling and it's like, what's going to happen? And is it, is it safe to open or, or do I care that it's like, that it's not safe to open because why would I want to do that? You know, or is this, uh, is this all real? And then to think that there's people that are actually really struggling, it, it feels much bigger than my restaurant. So it, it's been really hard to think yeah. about. And, to uh, and, <laughs> and um, so what has, what's actually been the best sources of information for you um, as a restaurant owner, um, as somebody embedded in the community? Um, you, you know, it, it, we've seen kind of waves of information um, come through. Uh, has there been anything that's been uh, any, any one or two sources that have been really good for you? I mean, I honestly love the city emails. Mm-hmm. I get them you know, the alerts that come out, I, I find them very helpful. I find all the Somerville business um, information, the emails that go out. I mean, I utilize the city services. Um, so I, I find all that info really helpful. In terms of restaurant stuff, there's such an overload of how to get through a PPP loan, how to get through this. And every company is trying to help us that it's almost like noise now. There's just so much out there. Um, so that's been really hard. So I try to use the city services and I check in on mass.gov for the coronavirus updates and everything else is just kind of background noise. Like, yeah. it's like, okay, I've got to check this and follow this, but it's, it's kind of overwhelming. Mm. And what are, what are the, the biggest challenges for you right now as, as a, as a restaurant owner? Um, so we, I haven't gotten any official guidelines yet, which I understand, you know, it's, this thing is morphing, you know, the pandemic is changing all the time and the number of illnesses. Um, so wondering if when I've read what's going on in other States, like, Oh, this place can open up at 10% capacity. I'm like, what 10% capacity, like our capacity is 98 or 99. So I'm going to let in, you know, nine, 10 people. What is that? Like, <laughs> is that even, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's clearly not. Yeah. But then you're like, well, you know, I feel like we are are so loved by the community, and people are buying gift cards and doing their best to buy takeout from us. And I've gotten some really beautiful emails from people about how even just our takeout like is giving them a sense of normalcy and back to what they really appreciated. So um, I was reading what, one email in particular out loud to some employees that, that uh, John and Luis. And we all were like teary eyed, like, like, okay, it's just, you know, it's a Ziki and, <laughs> but it's about the, the, the memories that we all have together. Like I, uh, my brother and I still joke, like I grew up, our restaurant when we were kids was Dapper Dan's, which is in the assembly square mall. Um, and so we used to love going there and it was always like, okay, if I could just have a Dapper Dan's and I feel like daddy Jones has, is, is Dapper Dan's to some of the little kids that come in. Like it's my Dapper it's their dapper dance. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so knowing that if, and when we can reopen, it's going to actually make sense and not disappoint people. Like I have this fear if it's like, well, how long is it going to be a 25% occupancy or X, Y, and Z? Like what's the, uh, the thought process behind that? So I'm, I think the most frustrating thing to get back to your question is like, just nobody really knows what to do yet. Mm. And 
I understand that. Like, I understand that they shouldn't know what to do yet. Like, none of us were alive in 1918. So <laughs> it's just the waiting game. The waiting part has been frustrating and just waiting to find out. And because I don't think it makes sense to rush to open if it's going to hurt people. Right. And, and part of that waiting is uh, not having the information maybe necessarily well, to, to, to set up guidelines. Um, right. And, and um, so like at a certain point is, is there, do, do you think that there's going to be a point where the, um, where you're just going to need that information, um, where you're going to need the, the guidelines? I mean, can it, can it, how much longer can, um, how it's been going, go on for you? Information wise. I mean, I know that we have a web, a webinar today. Um, so I, can it go on for months and months? No, like I'm going to be broke paying the bills, but like, like it's, you know, the, the money coming in from takeout is great. It's just, it's keeping it sane, but it's definitely not enough to be realistic in the long run. Um, but I, I'm hoping we can figure this out over the next, you know, couple of months. And, you know, for us, we have a big outdoor patio. So everybody's talking about maybe there's this outdoor dining aspect that can happen for people. And we would love that, um, especially if we could really spread out the way I've seen some other cities doing. Like there's so much space for no one driving. And in Central Square, I know they would turn some of the parking spaces into uh, seating Mm -hmm. and turn it into kind of patios for restaurants. I think that that could be a really cool thing to do. I mean... We've already turned Broadway into one lane, right? Like, why can't we take some of that, the parking spaces in some places and turn them into seating for restaurants? I think it could be kind of cool. Yeah. And I think it might be a nice way to, to keep it like that. Like, I've been sitting around like, do I even need a car? Why do I have a car? Should I get rid of my car? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it could be a nice way to transition for a lot of places and, and really change the things Hmm. um yeah maybe it it takes uh it involves new ways about thinking about our city streets maybe closing off streets a few days during the week and then allowing restaurants to spill out into the streets um to make sure that you know people are exercising physical distance and enough fresh air is going through Um, so who knows um Mm -hmm. you like you um alluded to earlier it we're looking it this is providing uh, a way for us to kind of look at the systems that have been in place um and maybe thinking of new systems uh new better systems that benefit people um you'd mentioned that when you were talking about uh food waste Mm -hmm. but there's better ways for um, businesses to be integrated with their communities. And maybe it involves things like closing city streets, you know, who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah, getting, getting a, a vision like that from, from leadership would be. Um, yeah. Would- I think we're lucky too, because Somerville is innovative and Somerville is, you know, we have so many resources um, that I for, a lot of the standards that will be set for the restaurant community and other small businesses. I feel like restaurants, we're getting a lot of, uh, I don't know if we're just the loudest, but I feel like there's a lot of businesses suffering and there's a lot of talk about restaurants, like, you know, tattoo parlors and little shops and hair salons. Like there's, it's going to be different for all of us. I've had friends say that they're going to maybe open longer hours and stagger the hairstylist so that people can still work. But there's different times of the day and it's like that really makes sense it's harder for restaurants because obviously people eat at certain times of day right but you can do different things at different hours so um it's going to be interesting like 30 years from now or even 100 years from now when people are looking back at all this and saying everything changed in you know 2020 and businesses started doing x y and z so Mm. And what's what's the best way for summer villains to help out small businesses right now? I I do think that um, the the gift cards are definitely they're definitely great um, because it's kind of like an interest free loan, right? Like you're not um, it's not like having to 
t- take a loan out from the bank, but at the same time, you do have to pay this back at some point. You know, they're going to come in and redeem it for goods. Um, I think getting takeout and also I think checking on, on neighbors, like they might be fine, but somebody else might need something. Um, and even if you don't need anything and you have something extra to give, you could buy something from one establishment and give it to somebody else that you know. Um, you know, whether it's actually, um, there's a yoga studio that did, uh, they did a fundraiser for us. And I thought that was kind of cool. I was like, Oh, I, I just, I've seen so much of people coming together that like it, it makes me feel good. And I'm like, we're not supposed to feel good right now. <laughs> like, uh, um, so it's really nice to see people uniting. And I think that neighbors can do that. And I honestly believe that they are. I was watching um, somebody like the produce pickup that we got that we, when we bought the produce from dark horse and somebody went to pick it up and they were actually a regular of ours. So it was funny and they picked it up and then they came and picked up chicken from us. Um, and I know that they were dropping it off to other families. So to see everybody connecting, I think as long as we don't stop doing that, we'll all be fine. We just have to keep the spirit of giving and the thinking about each other going and the businesses will come back and, you know, people can stay healthy, but we just have to not forget about it because it's kind of amazing. So, yeah, yeah. Agreed. And, and, um, I think that's, that's the best, I, we couldn't have ended this, uh, <laughs> this interview and this profile on, on you and, uh, and daddy Jones, uh, any, any other way, any better. Um, so I, I appreciate, um, you speaking with me and did you have any, any parting words or a parting thought, um, besides that really, uh, excellent, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, like yeah. I have so much thoughts all, all the time. No, uh, <laughs> um, well, I really, I'm really thankful to everybody that's donated into our GoFundMe and been supporting the restaurant. I, I was trying to email everybody back and thank them. And then it kind of got overwhelming. I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't keep up with this. Um, welcome to the world of, of nonprofits where you have to like follow up with everybody. <laughs> it's it's, it's wild. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, I find a nonprofit to be far more difficult than a regular business. <laughs> I, I, I was like, wow, I have a newfound respect for all of this. Um, so I think that no, I, yeah, no, I feel like I've said so much. <laughs> well, well, thanks again, uh, Demetra Murphy, the owner of daddy Jones restaurant. Um, and we encourage everybody to, to get out there, go to daddy Jones's website, which is daddyjonesbar.com daddyjonesbar.com um, and support this local businesses, uh, support the businesses in your area, support Somerville businesses um, and, and get out there and help your neighbors. Um, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.